Welcome to Fair Vote Toronto's webinar series. My name is Megan and I'm a volunteer with Fair Vote Toronto. Um, I'd like to start tonight with a land acknowledgement. So though we're joining tonight from all over Canada online, we at Fair Vote Toronto want to acknowledge that the land from which we join you has for thousands of years been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of Credit River. Today, Toronto is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to them for the opportunity to work on this land. Though there's much work to be done in this country to achieve a just and fair society for all, securing a more proportional electoral system is one step towards achieving this goal by allowing for more just democratic representation. For just a quick introduction to our organization, Fair Vote Canada is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization advocating for a citizens' assembly on electoral reform in Canada and its provinces. Fair Vote Toronto is one of the many chapters across the country, which helps us to lobby local MPs and mobilize at the grassroots level. So through our webinar series, we're hoping to connect the issue of proportional representation to other pressing issues to demonstrate that electoral reform is an important route of political change and discuss strategies for achieving it. So tonight for the fifth installment of our webinar series, we're joined by two activists from Fridays for Future Toronto, Chloe Naviva, to discuss voting systems and climate policy. So Chloe C is a climate justice activist with Fridays for Future Toronto and a coordinator for the organization's Ontario election preparation. She's an undergrad student at U of T studying neuroscience and health policy. Aviva Gail Bunzel is an organizer with Fridays for Future Toronto. She's a student at York University uh, where she's involved in several environmental groups and student government. So welcome Chloe and welcome Aviva. Okay, so it's great to have you both joining us tonight. Uh, to, to start things off, Chloe and Aviva, go ahead and take the floor and give us an introduction to Fridays for Future Toronto and some of the work that you guys have been up to. So first of all, thank you everyone for joining uh, Aviva and myself today. I know we're both very excited to be discussing this really important issue of proportional representation and how it relates to our democracy and the climate justice work that we do. Um, so Fridays for Future Toronto is a part of the movement of youth mobilizing for climate justice at the grassroots level. So climate justice means that we're not just fighting for responsible climate policies, but we're also looking at equity um, and seeing things through the lens of intersectionality. So that's the idea that we can't have climate justice without having racial justice, without having economic justice, housing justice, and just social justice in general. Pre-pandemic, most of our work consisted of doing school strikes, uh, rallies, marches, and organizing those things. Um, this started years before I joined the movement, so I'd really like to give credit to those organizers who built the movement we have now. Uh, but the work we've been doing during the pandemic has involved more branching out and finding other forms of direct action, whether it be in person or virtual. Fantastic, okay. So should we jump into some discussion, guys? Sure. Awesome. Okay, so a bit of context for listeners, and then we'll jump into some questions. So in Ontario, our government was elected with only 40% uh, of votes cast. So because there's more electoral competition on the left, uh, conservative parties across Canada can easily steal ridings without a majority of support. So we're going to talk about some of the implications of this on our climate. So could you two share an overview first of the impacts the Ford government has had on the climate and the natural environment as well, impacts that were made possible by our first past the post voting system? For sure, yeah, where to begin? Um, we could really talk about his harm all, all night, but yeah, Doug Ford and the Conservative Party of Ontario have had a completely detrimental impact on this province. Um, firstly, it's impossible to discuss this harm without looking at his completely unjust mishandling of COVID-19. Uh, we cannot really get into that here. However, this government's choices to ignore the science is disproportionately impacting people who are already marginalized in our current systems today. Uh, the ideology a lot of these decisions are made in is similar to the ideology of many of his harmful environmental policies. Uh, the decisions to put corporate profit over people's lives, uh, the focus on the private while letting the public suffer and again, a complete disregard for the science for our futures. These, and these are decisions, again, that are being made by a majority government, which only received 41% of the votes. Uh, so we're gonna go through a couple of this government's harmful environmental impacts today. Um, one example that comes to mind is the proposed Highway 413, 
uh, the building of this new toll highway will have a very negative impact on the environment and on communities. It involves paving over wetlands, farms, forests, the green belt, and habitats for 10 species at risk. And according to the environmental defense, it's also a very redundant highway and it'll cost taxpayers $6 billion and experts say it will only save commuters 30 to 60 seconds per commute, which is kind of ridiculous um, to say the least. Um, and then another important or very harmful impact this government has had is on the environment is also by weakening the Endangered Species Act. Um, this act used to be considered the most effective species at risk legislation in Canada. And it involved like an independent panel of scientists and knowledge keepers who would make criteria to classify species at risk uh, within Ontario. So the species could receive like legal protection and funding. But then in 2019, the Ford government changed this act in a number of ways, including by inviting people from corporations to the panel. And secondly, also by changing the criteria. So now in order to classify a species as at risk, the whole species must be at risk in all of its habitats, which sometimes is global. Um, so, and before it just had to be in Ontario. So, and Ford has also gotten rid of the position of the environmental commissioner, which really sends a message about this government's priorities. Yeah, and for me, when I think about the harm that the Ford government has brought on to climate and the natural environment, uh, what comes to mind first is uh, his elimination of cap and trade. Um, so this was something that was done earlier on in Ford's term. And just as a really brief overview for people that uh, may not be familiar with cap and trade, this is seen as kind of a market friendly approach to reducing carbon emissions, where we cap the total amount of emissions allowed in the province at some maximum level. And then each year we lower the cap slightly. So uh, Doug Ford and the Conservative government came in and eliminated this program. And the outcome was that there was a winding down of the Ontario Green Fund and a lot of renewable energy projects ended up being canceled. So this is Ford coming in and his government coming in and just putting all climate action at a halt or even taking us back many, many steps. And something else that also comes to mind, this is more of a recent thing that's been going on in the past few months. But uh, this is something called the Minister's Zoning Orders, or also known as MZOs. So MZOs are orders that are given by Ontario's Municipal Affairs and Housing Minister. And it allows the minister to decide how a piece of land in the province will be used. Originally, this was meant just for emergencies. So for example, in Elliott Lake, they only had one grocery store and that grocery store ended up caving in one day. So uh, an MZO was invoked so that they could develop one piece of land and build a new grocery store there so that people could have access to the food they needed. And another example of an emergency use of the MZO was to protect water quality at Lake Simcoe. So the MZO was put in place so that no negative development could interfere with the water quality there. However, since the Ford government came in, they've been using these MZOs in lots of non-emergency situations just as an excuse to develop more land. Um, and this was especially um, done during bill, uh, the passing of Bill 229. And in this bill, local conservation authorities are forced to allow MZOs to develop land no matter what the science says. So this means that if an MZO is ordered in an area that should be protected and needs to be protected for the nature and for uh, keeping community safe, uh, nature or local conservation authorities aren't allowed to say no, and they must issue a permit and allow that development to go through. I also want to point out that uh, Bill 229 is actually called the Protect, Support and Recover from COVID-19 Act. So this is just one example of Ford trying to slip in some like negative, uh, harmful things for our environment in a COVID relief bill. But we don't need to destroy the environment to recover from COVID-19, and we shouldn't perpetuate that myth. Um, one of the impacts of having these MZOs is uh, there has been a lot of uh, a lack of consultation with Indigenous peoples whose land is affected by all these developments. There's been a lot of destruction of vital wetlands, which increases risks of flooding. Uh, there's been more toxicity in our soil. And ultimately, this harms communities and harms people's health, which will hurt our chances at being resilient in the face of climate change in the long run. As Megan mentioned, uh, the first past the post system has led to Ford's conservatives winning um, 
full control over the provincial government, yet only getting 41% of the vote. So most voters, over half of voters, did not want Ford's Conservatives to take charge, and yet here they are, uh, with 40% of the vote, yet 100% of control over all climate policy in Ontario, which means they have 100% of control over environmental protections, which they've weakened. They have 100% of control over uh, what power environmentalists have, which they've stripped all their power. And they also have 100% of control over cap and trade and carbon markets, which they decide to eliminate. Mm -hmm. This has all led to a lot of inequitable impacts with Indigenous peoples, racialized and low income people being um, the main uh, people affected by these environmental harms. So for example, if you think about uh, an MZO that goes and develops wetlands and causes more flooding, the communities that are being flooded are likely to be those racialized low income communities. It's also led to a lot of irreversible harm. If you think about flooding uh, impacting people's homes and people's properties, that's damaging stuff that you can never get back. Okay, we covered a lot of great ground there. So we're gonna circle back to a couple of the things you've mentioned uh, later on. But one thing I wanted to comment on, which is so scary is it's, you know, when one party has all the control, it's not just the normal decision making that you usually expect from a government. They're actually eroding some of those very checks and balances that people expect to, to bind governments to, to have some protection or continuity across governments. But they're eroding those themselves. And that's a really scary thing that could have, you know, lasting impact. But to circle back to another thing you said, which is about the spin, uh, like with that COVID bill naming, which is so disingenuous. Um, anyway, um, let's focus in on that for a sec. So, um, you know, first past the post, it does have this tendency to split NDP, green liberal votes. Um, so we're stuck with these conservative governments and also their conservative ideology and spin on environmental issues, which is very unique, um, very economically focused, perhaps. Um, so can you walk us through some of the conservative climate lingo and explain why does it prevent or maybe obstruct real action from happening? Definitely. So something um, that I think you briefly mentioned uh, is the idea of individual action. That's something that uh, a lot of uh, conservatives, but honestly, a lot of people in politics and corporations alike tend to use. So uh, individual action can probably be best explained using the COVID-19 example that uh, you've just mentioned. So if we think about how the COVID-19 situation has been dealt with, uh, especially in Ontario, we've seen a lot of blame on individual people for perpetuating the pandemic and spreading the virus, rather than looking at the systems that are uh, responsible for spreading the virus. So for example, if you take a systems approach uh, to COVID-19, you can see that our workforce and our economy um, is to blame for a lot of the spread of the disease because it leaves no room for life to happen, for people to get sick. You know, if, uh, if you are an essential worker and you're starting to feel symptoms of COVID-19, um, you have to make that really horrible decision of having to choose between going into work, putting your coworkers at risk, but making the money you need for your family and for your survival, uh, or you can stay at home and not put people in that risk but then you don't have your income and you can't have that happen either. Um, and recently in Ontario, we've had some COVID restrictions announced that did not include any support for essential workers or for small businesses, um, no paid sick leave or anything like that, despite public health experts saying that this is what we need to curb the, the pandemic. Instead, they increased police power and turned uh, the COVID-19 pandemic into an individual problem, blaming it on people who are going out and criminalizing people for like driving or walking outside in groups of more than one, um, which again, like blames individual people for this whole crisis. Also, um, Doug Ford has this tendency to blame young people partying. Um, he'll go on TV and he'll get these really like, uh, he'll get these clips that go viral on the internet and on the news of him, like, uh, you know, admonishing young people for going out, but he doesn't, uh, he fails to recognize that young people take a lot of precarious jobs or, and they're in a lot of essential work and that increases their exposure. They may also live with big families or have lots of roommates. So living with a lot of people in that high density situation, it increases your risk to COVID of no fault on your own. Um, so we can clearly see that the COVID-19 approach is, uh, there's been a lot of talk about individual action and blaming individual people throughout this pandemic. And 
this blame of individuals is the same thing that has been happening in Canadian climate policy for decades. So if we go back all the way to uh, 1990, there was something called the Green Plan in Canada. This is like the first of its kind at the time. Uh, and it was this plan to try to address the climate crisis, but it focused on public education and encouraging people to take individual voluntary actions. And it ended up failing. And then seven years later in 1997, uh, Canada joined the Kyoto Protocol, which is this international agreement among a lot of nations to reduce their carbon emissions by 2012. And as a result, Canada tried to do this thing called Project Green to try to reduce their emissions. But again, Project Green was another um, initiative that was focused on public education, voluntary action, and did not work. Uh, Stephen Harper ended up pulling out of the Kyoto Protocol in 2011 without even coming close to the goals that they intended to reach by 2012. And something that's a, a bit more relevant to us is Earth Day, which is tomorrow. And uh, Earth Day has, uh, I believe it has changed a lot and has um, now more of a systems um, feeling to it. And I think that's to the credit of lots of amazing climate activism. But at first, Earth Day was started as a voluntary action type of thing, as a way to get individual people to make uh, little changes in their lives to fight climate change. Um, not only was this ineffective, but I would argue it's immoral to be putting all this responsibility on individual people to solve such a huge crisis. And blaming individuals isn't just done by governments, it's also done by corporations. So I'm sure a lot of people are aware of the idea of the carbon footprint. Um, but this idea was actually created by BP, the oil company. So BP had this uh, website, you could go online, calculate uh, your carbon footprint, calculate how much your individual actions are contributing to putting carbon in the atmosphere. So when you take a shower, when you go to work, when you go to school, whatever. Um, but clearly they're just trying to distract you from themselves, like the oil giant who is actually creating these fossil fuels and causing these problems uh, and blaming us for, you know, maybe taking a shower or something. Um, so government and corporations really just want the responsibility off of themselves and to put the onus onto people, which is just a disaster for people and for society. Um, a lot of times the solutions we see to climate change are um, things suggested like recycling, picking up litter, planting some trees, using reusable straws, turning off the lights when you're not in the room. And these are all important things and things that you can do. But um, it's inaccurate to say that these things that just making these individual changes will really solve the climate crisis. Really, we have to look at our system and uh, our global system, which is rooted in colonialism, racism and exploitation. This is a system that puts profit over people, especially when it comes to black and indigenous peoples. And picking off of that, like, obviously, uh, tackling the system is a very large and overwhelming job. However, it's impossible to make the changes needed without the system change and like without addressing like intersectionality of all the crises our world is facing. Like we need to go deeper, deeper than the individual and look at who is benefiting from the climate crisis. So like 1%, fossil fuel companies and many large corporations, and then look at who is suffering from the climate crisis. People who are already mar marginalized by our current systems, and then we have to fight to address this. However, this is something that all of, all of our governments are failing to do right now. Um, Prime Minister Trudeau's uh, response to the large climate strike in September 2019 was an election promise for Canada to plant 2 billion trees. Um, this is obviously better than Premier Ford, uh, who in 2019 canceled uh, the Ontario tree planting program. Um, so pr promising to plant trees is an important step. However, it completely fails to address the systemic uh, causes of climate change and ignores the fossil fuel industry completely. Uh, and it also fails to address how the climate crisis disproportionately impacts people. And these trees haven't even been planted yet anyways. Uh, and then meanwhile, to this inadequate promise of tree planting, Trudeau continues to push for more pipelines through indigenous land. So to face the climate emergency and the centuries of colonial crimes in Canada, we really need bold, brave action and we need to actively decolonize, we need to listen to Indigenous peoples, and we need to build systems of justice, of equity, care, and reciprocity. And we really need to act, like we'll talk about this more later, but we really just do not have time right now for political games or performative promises or individual conservative rhetoric that so many of our politicians at all levels of government are demonstrating right now. So I'd argue this is where kind of the importance of activism comes in. As activists, we 
we really must continuously hold our elected leaders accountable and then make the changes ourselves. Uh, we can make our voices heard through direct action and then also through making, working to make sure our leaders reflect at least some of our values and concerns in office. Um, we have a responsibility to counter this distracting conservative lingo and the systems of power which rely on it. And then from here, we can actively reimagine and recreate these systems that will be more just for all and for it. Absolutely. And this, this idea of like political accountability. So I actually came to um, proportional representation activism by way of climate activism, because I got so frustrated with the lack of um, action and just, just realizing that, you know, we are so time strapped and things just aren't, aren't happening because they're not taking it seriously enough because um, they don't have to sometimes like the Ford government, I think, um, they've made their political calculations and they think that they do not need to care about this issue in order to um, form government and win enough seats because the system is is so rigged in their in a, their favor. So um, so to jump a, to another topic, let's chat about something else. So um, another one of the pitfalls of first past the post is something called policy lurch. So I think probably most of our listeners are familiar, but I'll just give a short description. Um, so policy lurch is sort of describes the flip flopping of major policies every few years as governments uh, get into power and then work to undo the previous government's work. Uh, so we've seen a lot of that under the Ford government. Uh, so on social and environmental issues, though, this this lurch, it can have, you know, irreversible and even deadly consequences. So um, Chloe and Aviva, could you two share some of the impacts of policy lurch um, on environmental policy in Ontario? For sure, yeah. So yeah, like climate, the fight for climate justice and social justice, it is a long fight. It takes time, often a lot of backlash, is often kind of two steps forward, one step back. Um, and this is especially true in politics and in our current system, however, we really, again, we do not have time for policy lurches, which contribute to injustices and prevent the actions we needed. We need, um, according to the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, we have until 2030, if, if we get policies right, for global warming to be kept at a maximum of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we have the time to make these changes, so we should not lose hope. Hope is very important. We have to be able to imagine the world we want to create. Um, but the choices our governments and institutions are making today are high stakes, and we cannot get back this time. We also cannot get back the lives lost due to climate change or to systemic injustice and discrimination. We can only act to ensure the safety and justice for the future. So, and the policy lurch is just kind of one example of how party politics are constantly put ahead of making the effective systems change that benefits people. Uh, so much of the time, the focus is on securing political wins by undoing a previous government's work. And this often involves undoing policies which work to protect marginalized people and the environment, which has really unjust and negative effects. Um, it's pretty frustrating when one government sets out a plan for reaching like uh, the Paris Climate Agreement and works towards climate justice and social justice. And then the next administration comes, comes in and rolls back these plans. And it, again, it is especially easy for majority governments to do this. And it's really challenging in our current system to hold them accountable. Unfortunately, in, our in Ontario, um, our government is a prime example of, of this. But yeah, the back and forth um, between action and inaction, whenever political leadership is changed, is really unlikely to lead to any long-term systems change. We really need political parties to work together for these changes and to put the party lines aside. It's frankly pretty disheartening how something like the survival of people and the planet has become a partisan issue, generally associated with left. Doesn't really make much sense. And uh, hopefully a system of pr proportional representation would mean that parties would have to collaborate for these political wins and represent the needs of all voters. And this would mean less of a policy lurch, less in doing of progressive policies and more sustainable and bold and brave action. So opportunity. Awesome. Anything you had to Chloe or are you good? No, it's perfect. And like, uh, like Aviva mentioned, um, this just goes to show like party politics and uh, politicians putting political wins over real people's lives. 
Okay, so to to zoom out a little bit um, and talk about uh, democracy a little more broadly and how it impacts climate policies. Um, so I kind of feel like the hey fellow youth meme um, right now, but I'm going to ask a question about youth. So uh, you two are both youth activists. Uh, so what do you feel is unique about youth in the fight for political progress, whether that's in climate action or electoral reform? Yeah, um, I'd say there's a lot that's unique about youth and social movements. Um, youth are rising all around the world with a lot of passion and energy and organizing for what we believe in. Uh, I can only speak for my own experience and observations, but there's a lot of in inspiring hope and empowerment in taking action and like, coming together at a young age. And there's also a lot of fear and worry about the future and anger at the injustices of the current systems. Uh, there's a lot of imagination and a lot of indignation and also a lot of gratitude for all the amazing activists who came before us and who work with us. And something that's kind of interesting too is many young people also are, are too young to vote, uh, but it's really inspiring how they make their voices heard anyways. Uh, I'm using they because I'm 20, so I can vote. Um, one of the most exciting days of my life. Um, uh, but youth make their voices heard from many forms of activism, including direct act action, which we especially focus on at Fridays for the Future. And youth are making a difference even without a seat political to decision makers table. And there are also movements of youth fighting for access to that seat. So for example, there's an inspiring campaign in British Columbia uh, to lower the voting age to 16 uh, called Vote 16 BC, which my half sister is an organizer for. And young people have so much at stake, so much to lose in political decisions right now and are generally being completely ignored in our current electoral system. Uh, we really care about the present and the future and are fighting for it. And, yeah, and, uh, I'd like to say like uh, something that's unique to youth activists, I think, uh, as opposed to some adult climate activists is that we're fighting for our generation and our futures. I know so many friends that are too scared to ever consider having children just because they think that the world that we'll live in will not be healthy and safe. So we're trying to fight for our lives and so that we can live in a healthy, uh, as healthy of a world as anyone else that came before. Yeah, it's really interesting. I remember um, the global climate strike, which was now quite a while ago, I guess it was in 2019 in the fall. Um, the kind of people that you see there, the demographics, I guess, it's a lot of young people, um, a lot of, you know, teens like skipping class, which is great. A lot of college students and then um, kind of like parents of, of young kids who like brought their 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 toddlers or their little kindergartners to the, the strike. So it's, it's I think it's beautiful to see so many people um, caring about, you know, our own futures and then their their kids' futures as well. So, yeah. So to, to jump topics a little bit, um, talk about some other groups uh, that democracy isn't really uh, representing right now. So do you think that our democracy, our voting system, uh, do you think they create spaces for voices of Indigenous groups and individuals on environmental policy? So this is such an important topic and I'm glad we're bringing it up, but um, also we, before we get into it, we should really think hard about the implications of colonization, how it's led to settlers imposing their system on the nations that were already here before. Um, we're not going to speak on behalf of Indigenous peoples, and we understand that there's a lot of diversity of thought among Indigenous peoples about what their relationship with the Canadian systems of government should be. So these are discussions that entirely belong to them and should not be interfered with um, by anyone else. <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah, Canada fails Indigenous peoples time and time again with, with violence and broken promises. And an example that comes to mind where Indigenous rights and lives have been ignored by governments for decades is the mercury crisis in Grassy Narrows. Um, so in the 2019 federal election, the chief of Grassy Narrows, uh, Chief Rudy Turtle, ran for office with the NDP in response to broken promises and the lack of action. And it was an extremely close race in a huge riding for land area. Uh, but the conservative candidate, conservative candidate won with about 9,000 votes, the Liberals with about 8,000 votes, and Turtle had almost 8,000 votes, and then the Greens had approximately like 1,500 votes. And so this is a riding across many communities and across the political spectrum. However, now all of them are represented by a conservative, conservative MP, and Grassy Nearest obviously still does not have the justice or action that they deserve. And this is a riding with many Indigenous nations. However, 
it does not have indigenous representation representation in the federal legislature. So if we had a different political system, something kind of beyond the beyond first past the post, there would be that direct representation and power. And indigenous folks have always been at the leaders in the forefront of the environmental and climate justice movements. Um, there's a complete double standard where kids and youth and white people who fight climate justice are generally congr congratulated by the mainstream and by governments for our activism. And this congratulations obviously does not translate into action by our government. However, it does mean that many of us can protest and make our voices heard safely. Meanwhile, indigenous land defenders and climate activists who have been fighting for justice and action for years are met with continuous violence and injustice by the state. So if we want climate policy, we have to decolonize and we have to listen to indigenous peoples and we must actively make space for them in positions of political power and then also make sure our systems are set up in a way which actively lead to sovereignty and justice. Thanks for sharing that example. That is a crushing, crushing example of how First Past the Post is failing to provide representation of the of the riding in a really, I, I don't know, more, more faithful way. Um, that is just crushing. But yeah, I, I completely agree on the, the whole idea of politicians congratulating youth. It is so cringe um, to for them to like get up and say, thank you, you're so inspiring. Um, it's crap, it's total crap. And it's just, uh, you know, they, they it's just speeches and it doesn't ever translate into strength of policy. Yeah, so I think we should call them out on that as much as possible. Uh, to jump over to kind of like the front end of the democracy uh, uh, and talk about nomination processes. So uh, nomination processes, so how uh, the parties select the candidates that they're going to run in each riding. So do you think that climate activists, um, a lot of whom are young or female or indigenous or all of the above, do you think that um, they have a fair chance for true climate champions to uh, you know, participate in these nomination contests and possibly win and then go on to run in elections? Uh, so no, I don't think that our nomination process gives anyone a fair chance, especially for many marginalized populations. This is actually one of my favorite topics to talk about um, as of late. But uh, the Samara Center for Democracy has done some incredible uh, work and really looked into nomination elections in Canada really in depth. So uh, if there's any numbers or facts that I mentioned, it all comes from their amazing work and their studies. So uh, we know that in Canada, parties have all the power. So how often do you see someone elected who has no party affiliation? Not very often because uh, since 1993, fewer than half a percent of those who were elected to parliament were independents. So you really need to be part of a political party to have a good chance at winning political office. Um, so if you want political office, how do you go about representing a party in an election? So this is through nomination elections or nomination contests which um, as Megan mentioned, is a way for members of parties to decide who represents them in each riding. And the winner becomes the candidate for their party and will go on to run for MP or MPP in Ontario. But in these nomination elections, we found that not many people compete. So the Samara Center studied all the federal nomination elections from 1993 to 2015. And they looked at over 6,600 candidates and found only 17% got there through a competitive nomination race. Between 2003 and 2015, over 70% of the 3,900 nomination contests held had one person ride, running. So they were running completely unopposed. And parties that uh, often directly appointed people to run in uh, these races, so having no nomination process at all. Central parties, so these are the people in the higher ups uh, of the big political parties, they get to decide when nomination contests open and close, who can and can't run in a contest, and they can also decide to let incumbent MPs automatically become the candidate without having to face a contest at all. This process systematically leaves, pe leaves people out and the structure of nomination contests is built on purpose to be confusing. 
So one way that they're confusing is that the nomination period is really short and they're also unpredictable. They have no standardized starter end dates. They can really start or end any time depending on the riding and the party. Um, the Samara Center study found that like half of the uh, nomination elections that they looked at lasted three weeks or less. And almost 500 of these nomination elections lasted five days or less. So very short periods of time. And by having these short nomination periods, we're less likely to see strong competition from contestants who aren't constantly plugged into the party. Um, you need time to organize, to do paperwork and to gather support. So if you aren't sure when the nomination election is starting, then you're losing that valuable time. Party insiders are favored rather than people who are a bit on the outside, um, who may have newer and more progressive ideas. And people who are simply just busy are also left out because if, uh, for example, I think about a single parent working multiple jobs, trying to make ends meet, they might not be keeping up with every single thing that their party is doing. And then they'll be left out of the process of selecting a, uh, a candidate. So contestants who know when a nomination contest is coming up can also uh, benefit because they can start spending money before the official campaign period begins. And this money is not captured under the Elections Canada spending limits, which means that uh, these contestants can invest more money. Again, this favors party insiders and just people who have more money. Just knowing that a party supports a particular candidate can really discourage others from running. And another way that um, central parties discourage people from running is by vetting. So they have this highly intrusive vetting process where if you want to run to represent your riding, you need to provide really um, a lot of details about your finances, your family life, social media accounts, your employment history, immigration history. You have to show your credit score, your criminal record. Um, and parties also have no obligation to disclose any of their vetting process information to Elections Canada. So this process is completely kept under wraps. Uh, other ways that contests lack transparency is that parties have no requirement to release information on how many votes were even cast, and they have no requirement to release uh, information about how many contestants were prevented from running in the first place. So through this vetting process, they can really pick and choose who they want to run in the nomination elections and eventually get power. Parties can also just do appointments, which is when they handpick who they want to represent the riding um, and they don't have an election at all or a contest at all. So parties will make the argument that these appointments are for diversity reasons, um, to promote uh, having a more diverse group of people running and to get people who may not normally be chosen uh, a place to uh, a platform. However, the Samara Center compared those candidates who were directly appointed by parties with candidates who weren't appointed and won their nomination elections. And they found that candidates who were appointed directly were not any more diverse. So this seems to be just an excuse for the parties to put who they want in charge and possibly less progressive people who are less likely to stir, to stir the pot in charge. Um, so the central party really holds the final word on who gets to represent a riding through appointments and through vetting. There's nothing democratic about this process. And something that really blows my mind too is despite all these things, despite how parties really have such a disproportionate effect on who gets elected to office, despite all that, they continue to be publicly funded. The parties have their political campaigns funded by Canadian taxpayers, um, but they're legally considered to be private institutions. So Canadian law largely leaves these parties alone and lets them make their own rules. Um, the Samara Center found that 45% of Canadians trust political parties to do what's right. So we're just entrusting these private entities to hold democracy, to uphold democracy and to ensure that everyone who wants to run has the opportunity to, um, and everyone can have a say in the nomination election process. But in reality, they're not doing a good job upholding democracy at all. The nomination system is full of inequities. People from marginalized groups are much less likely to run. And this could be because, you know, if you're from a marginalized group and you see all your life that uh, your voice doesn't seem to matter as much as other people, then having these roadblocks makes you less likely to want to run. Also, women who ran a nomination contest were just as likely as male competitors to win, but they made up just 28% of nomination contestants. Um, so there's definitely an, an inequity there. Also, women are often made to be sacrificial lambs, which means that they're being put into, uh, they're being placed as candidates in writings that parties know they'll lose. Uh, 
So they'll put women in there. They'll be able to say, oh, we're so diverse. We have so much representation, but they're really just putting women there um, to lose and to, you know, uphold like more male people in government. There's so many layers of, um, you know, them being so disingenuous. And it's interesting because like, you know, the complete lack of transparency at pretty much every step in this process, it doesn't guarantee that they're being shady but if there's no way for us to know if they're being shady or not, chances are at some point in time, every party's done a little, you know, a little fiddling to get the, the outcomes that they, that they want for the sort of, you know, party insiders. Um, but yeah, especially, especially the gender angle, it's, it's terrible um, that um, I think, yeah, if you compare, like, I think for the Liberal Party, especially, if you compare the, uh, I guess, the gender balance of the candidates versus uh, who is elected, it's very, very stark different uh, proportion. So, okay, so carrying this forward a bit um, to beyond the nomination process. So let's, uh, let's say that some climate champions do get elected into Parliament or into legislature. So even if they do get elected, do you think that their voices are heard in our governance system? And do you think they can make an impact? Um, yeah, so I guess within the party, there's a lot of um, challenges. Like party discipline is a pretty huge thing in Canada for those who don't know, that's like uh, when all representatives in a party vote exactly the same way and have the same messaging. Um, and this really depends on the leadership in the party, like who sets the apology agenda, who sets the stances for the whole party, um, rather than letting um, individual representatives who, who have like a closer contact and connection with their riding uh, to take on these big policy and leadership positions um, that help their constituents the most. Um, also, again, there's kind of a lack of transparency, um, which is not good given um, everything. And then uh, within the functioning of the political parties, there's really just not a lot of awareness about like the concept of backbenching, but obviously, you know, climate champions, they do, we, we need them in there to, to make the difference, but it's a lot of uphill battle. Yeah, uphill battle for sure, because of all the, all, everything that Aviva mentioned with party discipline and having to stick with the same policy message. Um, also, uh, climate champions in parliament can have a difficult time making a difference just due to politics, uh, politicians just wanting to get political wins. So uh, one recent example is there's an MP named Leah Gazan who put in this uh, private member's bill called Right to a Healthy Environment, which was the idea that uh, the human right to a healthy environment would be incorporated into like our whole list of human rights. And uh, she is a, an NDP MP. So the bill was voted down by Trudeau's liberal government last month. Yet just a few weeks after voting it down, the liberals began floating the right to a healthy environment idea as an option for them. And this just goes to show that current political system, the current political system we have produces parties that are more concerned with getting political wins than with passing the best policy for the most amount of people. So parties prefer putting their name on policies, taking their credit, taking credit for things, preventing other parties from getting any wins uh, over cooperating with others to make fast and effective climate policy. And this is a major roadblock for um, climate policy that is perpetuated by our first past the post system. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think um, more collaboration between parties would be only a positive thing, if only to improve the degree to which they feel they have ownership um, and bragging rights around uh, what policy they've managed to um, secure or pass. So, okay. So that wraps up all the questions I had prepared. Um, there was one question in the chat about a citizens assembly. I responded to it. Um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, so Tom, oh, there you are. So no. So anyway, we had a question, but I'm not quite sure of the details of it. So if there's any other questions, um, you can pop them in the chat right now while I uh, do a little wrap up and we can address them after or just finish things up. So um, a big thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. This was a lot of fun and a really interesting conversation to have at the the intersection of two really incredibly important issues um, in Ontario and Canada right now.
So thanks so much to Aviva and Chloe for sharing that perspective. So just so everybody knows, there will be a recording of tonight's webinar shared. Um, so if you wanna watch it again or send it to someone who you think would be interested or missed it, um, and if you'd also like to receive an invitation to our next webinar, um, please make sure to sign up for our mailing list. And lastly, if you wanna learn more about supporting uh, the movement for proportional representation, your browser will automatically take you to a page on our website showing the top 10 actions you can take to advocate for PR. Okay, so looks like that's everything. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you to Chloe and Aviva so much and good night.